Welcome to the Same Day Podcast, where we discuss driving incremental business growth and other topics related to real estate, property management, and entrepreneurship. Now, to the show at hand. Hi there, Yoni Schmidt here, hosting today's episode of the Same Day Podcast, where I connect with top business and real estate leaders. Past guests include Brandon Neff from the Neff Lab, Chris Lyle from State Farm, and Kurt Volk, one of our clients. Today's episode is brought to you by Key Rental Property Management. At Key Rental Property Management, we are a full-service property management company helping our clients buy, renovate, and operate real estate assets. We help our clients build wealth while taking the headache out of property management. That's why no matter what rental you have, a single-family home, condo, townhome, or apartment, we have the management solutions you need. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Jared Goldfarb, the Senior Vice President of Commercial Lending at Bank First on our podcast. Jared, a seasoned professional in the banking sector, brings a wealth of experience and insight from his years of experience in commercial lending. With his roots in Tulsa, Jared has played a pivotal role in shaping the financial landscape of numerous businesses. His journey, marked by dedication of astute financial acumen, has positioned him as a respected voice in the banking community. His commitment to fostering growth and success in the commercial sector makes him an exceptional guest. We're excited to dive into his perspective and learn from his vast experience in the dynamic world of banking finance. Welcome, Jared, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Yoni. Uh, Wonderful. So, Jared, if you don't mind, we'll hop straight into it and um, kind of just uh, I'll ask a few questions here and, uh, you know, we'll uh, hopefully create some good content for our audience and some, uh, share some good perspectives with them. And the first thing I'd like to know is how did you get started in the banking industry and what was it that drew you to bank first? Uh, let's see, um, starting in the banking industry, uh, wasn't by design. Um, I graduated college with an MIS degree, Management Information Systems, uh, which is a business degree with a focus on tech, computers, which is what I thought I wanted to get into. Um, at started college, dot-com boom was sort of going and blowing. And, you know, by the time I finished school, that bubble had sort of burst and finished school looking for jobs. Just if I wanted to stay in the Tulsa market or, or, or even move to Texas, which was a consideration at one point, it just... I didn't have the opportunities that I thought I would. So in order to get out of my parents' house, I uh, applied for a banking job with Bank One at the time, which uh, eventually ended up being purchased by Chase while I was there. Um, I applied for a, a teller job, actually, um, right out of school, had my bag, my car was packed with my stuff from college and went to my first interview and uh, stepped in and the and the, the district manager said, well, We'd like for you to uh, actually apply for this relationship banker role, which is really more of the branch level retail uh, banker that you see when you walk into uh, a, you know any bank in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, that role was new accounts. It was uh, home equity lines of credit. It was uh, you had to get your investment license. So you had to do Series Six and Sixty Three, uh, selling annuities and uh, mutual funds. Um, and then there was a small piece that was small business. Um, and so you got my first, you know, sort of job was a really a, an array of products and services in the banking world that I sort of got away, you know, a taste of each. And I sort of gravitated towards the loan side versus the, you know, investment side and, uh, uh sort of took it from there, uh, in knowing that I wanted to get in the commercial lending world, um, uh, met a, a a family owned bank uh, at a wedding. Actually, met a gentleman whose family owned the bank and told him I wanted to get the commercial side of lending. You know, this was twenty years ago, and uh, ended up going to work for them, family owned bank in Tulsa. Um, great experience. Learned the commercial side, underwriting from start to finish of a loan. Really, really gave me my first entry into that environment. Um, was there for. Uh, five or so years and uh, ended up having an opportunity with uh, a distressed bank that a group of investors were going to work for. Um, and uh, they were going to uh, go in and, and build the bank up and eventually sell it and flip it, which was the plan uh, from the start. 
So knowing that it was a short term sort of play, ended up going to work for them. Also an incredible experience uh, in learning sort of the side of the balance sheet management of a bank and building one up and looking for potential uh, acquirers. Um, sold that bank and then uh, the bank that acquired us was out of state bank and sort of had their own model of how they wanted to operate. And um, it wasn't quite in line with our uh, model that we had previous to the sale. And so I started to look for a new opportunity and um, evaluated about 10 banks in town and kind of narrowed it down to two or three that I feel like I was comfortable working for. And uh, Bank First in the end was the one that sort of caught my eye and I couldn't try to poke holes in it and really couldn't. And so ended up taking their offer and I've been here for five years as of last or two months ago. So, wow, that's awesome. Walking into a bank to apply for a teller position and then um, the district manager telling you that he's more interested in you being a, a relationship banker must have felt really good. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. It was, I didn't know anything, you know, I didn't know a ton about banking at that point, but I mean, they did, they even did like the old school, like sell me this pen or sell me this stapler, I think was the yeah. view. And I'm like, what am I getting into here? But oh yeah. my God, that's awesome. Um, today you can use chat GPT to, uh, ro role play with you. Sell me this stapler. Um, oh, and it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So sh could you share with us, I guess, uh, a little bit about from joining bank first, how, how did your journey look like? What did your journey look like? Um, you know, uh, becoming senior vice president, uh, at the bank. So in that evaluation process that I told you about of looking for my next employer, I, I, in those previous three jobs that I had, I knew from each one of those, you know, a little bit of each one of those banks kind of had a piece of what I was looking for. I love the, the, the dynamic of Chase with their technology and their, uh, you know, being the largest bank in the world and just mm -hmm. incredible sort of systems and processes. Um, then the, the family owned bank, which was more of the true community bank world of we're doing uh, mom and pop manufacturing shops. We're doing, you know, uh, to, from a from a little deal to, you know, multimillion dollar credits to then the flip bank of, of the, the um, startup and flip bank that I worked for was another true community bank. Uh, we had speed, we had uh, competitiveness and um, and true customer service. So I took you know, I was looking for a little bit of all of those three banks. And then that sort of led me to Bank First that has a collection of all of those things that I loved about those previous banks. Yeah, love it. Um, stepping into Bank First, I guess, and being there for five years now, what, kind, what unique challenges have you encountered in the commercial lending space and world? Um, and how do you navigate those? Um, so it's been a unique time and that I've been here for five years, you know, throughout those five years, you think about that's, you know, 2018 through now we've had a, you know, an election, a global pandemic. We've had mm -hmm. historically as low of rates as I've seen in my 20 years, we've now back to rates now that are historically over the last 20 years, some of the highest that we've seen um, commercially. And, and uh, it's the challenge is, I think as a bank, and I'm probably going to repeat myself a bunch here in, in, in this message is like, stay consistent, stay uh, uh, disciplined in your lending and, uh, you know, sort of true to the model of like, you know, customer, uh, people first, you know, mm -hmm. looking at the relationships um, and just staying, staying sort of in your, in your, in your wheelhouse, so to speak of, you know, don't try to get too far outside of what you've what you know and what you do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's how we've been able to navigate sort of these choppy waters that we've been in over the last, you know, three or four years. Yeah, ignoring those shiny objects. Matt Zalk always tells me when I bring him a commercial deal opportunity, like a commercial building, uh, you know, retail or, or industrial. And, you know, our focus is single family residential and, you know, small boutique multifamily. Uh, he just looks at me, you know, and says, 
ignore it, right? You know, stay yeah. stay focused on on what we do best because if we're not gonna um, stay consistent, then we will start uh, doing a disservice to our current clients and the ones that we're trying to you know bring on in in those new spaces. And if we're not going going to commit ourselves to learning those new things, um, they're just shiny objects. You mentioned you know people and relationships in in this last answer. Um, you know, the bank, bank first has a commitment to loyalty matters. And I know that over the last five years, there's been not just in terms of, um, you know, the pandemic and interest rate fluctuations, there's also been a lot of, uh, you know, regulatory changes that may have affected some of your clients. And uh, some of them, you know, may have experienced uh, growth, some of them may have experienced uh, challenges. How does uh, Bank First commitment to loyalty first uh, loyalty matters influence your approach in commercial lending, um, in relationship building, and you know the clients that you serve and the people that you do business with? Well, I I I truly you know this bank you know I think a lot of banks will say we look at the people we look at the people and we truly do it's our first thing we look at before we even evaluate a credit and. Uh, I truly believe in it, and I truly believe in gut feel when it comes to talking to a business owner. And and if you walk out of there and you're impressed by them, or you or you get a weird feeling of like mm, that doesn't seem so mm-hmm. great. More often than not, I've found in my in my time that you're probably right that there might be something kind of wonky about the deal or whatever. But so loyalty and true is yeah. I mean it's a it's a great slogan. Um, it's uh, it's it's truly how we operate in that you know we we will be loyal to you if you're loyal to us and we will we will you know provide the best service and platform we can offer in the way of products and services and um the ability to move quickly for you and um mm-hmm. and and I truly believe that and I I I I've pride I you know I pride myself on you know at least my portfolio and my client base is look I'll answer the phone anytime you need me I'll work as hard as I can to to get you what you need done in a timely manner. Um, there has to be that mutual respect of, you know, we have a partnership, and uh, I I think that as long as there's that treated of mutual respect, then you understand me and I understand sort of your process. I'm not going to tell you how to run your business. Uh, I can offer you as you know the the you know whatever you need in the way of uh, financing and and other services that I can help your business, but. Uh, just understand that that's that's kind of the way I, I operate. So not so much yeah. transactional, but really relationship based. Yeah, that's true. You always answer my call when I call you, and I'm not even a client of the banks yet. Uh, sure. And hope to hope to finance a deal through you guys. And I know we've looked at some stuff in the past, and I've done some work for your clients um, over the years. How has the bank evolved to meet these changing needs of um, Oklahoma businesses? and uh the people that you serve uh well bank first is it's been around for a while um they've evolved probably more slowly than some of the other maybe uh, banks in town that you've seen kind of jump out there and maybe try some new technology or something new in the way of uh, a product or service uh, or offering Um, i think we're very conservative in jumping in the water too quickly um, but when we find a product that we feel like is necessary and would be helpful for the client base, they roll it out. They're they're very uh, sophisticated in how they evaluate a certain product that we might uh, roll out. But um, I would say, in the way of um, innovation and whatnot, we're we're probably not that bank. Um, but I think that's also worked for us to our advantage and and uh, how we operate. But. Yeah, the the tried and true traditional way of doing business and banking. Yeah, um, it, it, love it. We're not we're not by by any means we're not like dead last in the way of like our our technical technological advancements, but uh, we're certainly cautious in in how we evaluate mm-hmm. new stuff. Yeah, speaking of technological advancements, what strategies do you uh, use to maintain that balance between the traditional? Uh, banking values and these uh, modern tech changes, right? Um, so we, you know, we, I think we have a, 
we obviously, like many banks, use a third party uh, uh, operating system for our online banking. Um, mm-hmm. th- those companies, we you know, the companies that we choose to utilize, uh, we we have a heavy heavy reliance upon their technological you know, sort of evaluations of new ideas and new products and the way things look and user interface and whatnot. Um, so in the way of, um, you know, how we suppose, you know, how we use those to our advantage, I would say, you know, for me, a lot of how I prospect and how um, I uh, acquire new clients is really sort of an old school, you know, word of mouth or networking or, um, you know, just, I, you know, you said we haven't done business yet in the, you know, directly together, but in the way of you would be the center of influence for me in the way of you refer business to me, you, uh, you know, I'm available for a certain product type and, uh, or client. And so that's all, you know, I have, you know, 20 or 30 of, of you in town that, you know, can, can send me an opportunity or know that an opportunity, Hey, let's think about Jared for that. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's been my, you know, that's been my method for years. Yeah. We love that. We love uh, being connectors and being connected with other people. And um, when it comes to banking in general, I think it's super important because, um, you know, when you're financing uh, a single family residential portfolio, for example, you also have to have confidence in the uh, purchaser's ability to effectively manage that portfolio and, you know, perform and and, uh, make make their uh, payments, right? So, um, that's where we come in, right? As the as the professional property management company, um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of community led banking and its impact on the local businesses and just community in general? And how have you seen it shape uh, our city here in Tulsa? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it's an important one because. I, I I go back to this, even though no one loves to talk about COVID really in those first few months of it, but, you know, with the PPP loan program, had a lot of people who uh, didn't have a banker, so to speak, a commercial banker from a business perspective that they could call and get a hold of, you know, immediately. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of big banks in town that it's hard to get a hold of anybody. And I think people saw that how still relative it is to have uh, and important it is to have a true commercial banker that you can call um, in those moments of need. And um, uh, I think, you know, that to me was showing that community banks are still very much viable um, in in the marketplace. The thing that is tough is there's a ton of us. And in Tulsa, mm-hmm. you know, there's a we have a ton of competitors. Um, and so how do you differentiate yourself? It's tough. I mean, you've you've. Uh, You've got to be, as I mentioned, you've got to be quick and agile, and you've got to be competitive and knowledgeable, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, timely. And and that's uh, that's tough for a lot of banks to do. Um, there's a lot of red tape that a lot of banks have in town, um, and that was something, as I mentioned about Bank First, that I love was um, the process from a loan from start to finish is so much more pleasant. Uh, in the way for me and for my client, then, you know, another, you know, other banks that I've, or people that I know that work other banks or other banks that we've had dealings with. Um, mm-hmm. So that's my, that's the way I operate. I have my competitive advantage. So. Mm-hmm. For a new client, would you say the process could be 30 to 45 days um, from start to finish? Is that somewhat accurate? And it, it, it depends on the, it depends on the, the, what kind of loan we're doing if we're talking mm-hmm. about like a single family rental yeah that's that's definitely doable um if we're talking about a you know a sizable uh commercial mm-hmm. properties industrial space or something like that i mean we typically are doing 60 to 90 days because of the you know you have to do environmental evaluations and mm-hmm. uh, the appraisal is a little more extensive and some things like that that take a little longer in the title um and if, you know and also inspection periods are a little bit longer uh so yeah, we on the on the larger commercial stuff, we're doing sixty to ninety days. Yeah, um, that's interesting. And uh, for how about for larger portfolios? Say a portfolio of ten single family residential homes, you would say maybe also closer to sixty days to 
get through due diligence and you know make sure that uh, those those assets and the collateral is uh, you know something the bank feels comfortable with. Yeah, I, I I don't mean to interrupt you there, but I I think on from my side, my process is it, the day that I get everything from the client in the way of financials and and whatnot. I say from that point, it's a it's two weeks for me to you know evaluate and underwrite and work a deal to approve. Mm-hmm. Then you know the, the stuff that takes longer is obviously the appraisal and the title and other you know evaluations and whatnot, but. Uh, so my process, you know, I, when I said 60 to 90 days on that last answer, it's more of what the third party ancillary uh, mm-hmm. have to rely on to close a loan that take a little bit longer than, you know, my process. Yeah, makes sense. And so for, you know, um, small businesses and real estate investors that are, you know, maybe local, not local, out of state, um, what advice would you give them when they're seeking fin- financing through Bank First in you know today's economic climate? Um, I would say you know a lot of times what I'm looking for, and and this is me personally, not every of course every other commercial lender, but I'm I'm looking for um, other income sources typically. If if the, if the reliance upon their entire income is are these rental properties, I I'm probably not the banker for them. Um, mm-hmm. I look for, you know, my my ideal sort of single family rental uh, uh, investor is someone with a business or a day job. And then this is more passive income for them. Uh, and uh, so my reliance is, hey, look, if if, you know, they lose a couple tenants or things get a little hard, uh, they've got this other income to live off of from their day job or business. And then this can be sort of navigated on the rental side. Uh, outside of that, so when when I'm when I'm evaluating new deals, that's typically what I'm looking for in the way of a sort of uh, prospect, I'd say. Um, mm-hmm. um, in the way of sort of what they should be prepared for, it, you know, my my mind is you always want uh, equity in the deal, and and you always want uh, you know, bank first likes you know typically twenty percent into a deal. I know some banks are doing fifteen percent of cost. Um, you know, to me, it's it's, and then the amortization typically, you know, some banks are doing twenty five, some are doing twenty, uh, some mm-hmm. are doing longer than that. Um, some private investors are probably doing thirty years, maybe even longer than that. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, for me, I it, you know, I'd want to get out of the debt. Uh, a little bit faster if it works, and and if you don't need the income, uh, I'm accelerating that amortization. If I'm the investor, just to you know get that debt paid down, and mm-hmm. to move on to the next one. But um, I have one of my best uh, sort of single family rental investors that I deal with. He puts everything on ten or fifteens. Um, he he's very disciplined in the deals that he's looking for. He he does wholesale and he does uh, you know basically he. He wholesales anything he doesn't want. He'll sell it mm-hmm. off, and then he keeps the ones that he finds that he's that he that you know. Obviously, there's these are like estate deals and things where he's going out and finding you know families of deceased people that want to get rid of a house quickly mm-hmm. or something like that. And he's getting these things um, at a really nice level. He's getting in at a really nice level, which is you know to me eighty percent of the the battle is finding mm-hmm. a good deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, that that's, that's for me as perspective on these single family deals, if that's what we're talking about is more of like staying disciplined and finding a good opportunity versus reaching and, you know, maybe overpaying for a house and then you're already behind the curve. Uh, mm-hmm. You've got still got improvements to make or, you know, renovations and things like that, that you've got to do that. And then compound that with the interest rate. Plus, you know, no offense, but plus the property manager, it's like, man, where's the profit at this point? And it gets pretty yeah. skinny, as you know. So, um, um, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, um, I guess from a, from an advice perspective to investors who are coming into the market for the very first time is make sure that you have 20, maybe 25% down, a uh, good amount of healthy equity, uh, full-time W-2 job, and, you know, be prepared to... Uh, you know, take out a loan product that's a twenty-year amortization or shorter, right? Yeah, I mean that's and, that's my that's for me ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pretty risk averse myself, and I don't have a huge appetite for debt. So 
I can totally respect that. And um, m- most, if not all of my properties are, um, I buy them with a higher amount of equity. Um, now that money's expensive though, it uh, doesn't necessarily always make a ton of sense, right? And so we're seeing this um, transition in the market to where there's a lot of single family residential uh, investors that are uh, on the sidelines waiting for something to happen, right? Or those that are finding those very opportunistic deals and you know they're going out and they're buying them. Um, generally speaking, uh, can you talk a little bit, I guess, about uh, the interest rates level that we're seeing today? It's February 2nd of 2024 on a 20-year AM, five-year fixed, uh, someone with you know good income, great credit, excellent credit. Um, are we talking seven, eight percent? Are those the are those the rates that we're talking about? And how do those change if you were to say um, fifteen year amortization or ten year amortization and be a little bit more aggressive with your pay down? Yeah, um, it's sort of a uh, a misconception of. Uh, of of sort of commercial lending and it is that there's sort of a trade for these you know uh, maybe more more equity in uh and you know a, a more aggressive amortization might get you a better rate and i think that's that's as a result of sort of the mortgage side of consumer mortgage lending where mm-hmm. they have different products that have these sort of you do a 15 year it's a better rate or the jumbo versus whatever and i, I don't i'm not well versed in that so i don't i don't I just know from my personal experience with my own home, it's like, you know, you could do a 15 year and get a better rate or, you know, your your loan to value is a little bit lower. Maybe you can buy down the rate. In my world, it's a little more simple than that. You know, we mm-hmm. we price uh, as a function of, um, you know, our funding costs. And and right now our funding costs um, as a bank, Bank First is, is, is fortunate that we don't have to borrow uh, uh, um, we can utilize our own deposits and, but still as a, as an internal cost to us, to our sort of our headquarters, you know, our funding sources are, you know, are, it's basically the fed fund rate, which is like 5.4% right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we've got to price things with a margin on top of that, uh, that one pays for us here, pays for our building, pays for, you know, but still remains profitable to the bank too. So, um, to throw out a number right now in the way of like a rate, I mean, I think you 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 know you would you would want to be somewhere, uh, you know, prime right now is eight and a half percent. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you you you'd probably want to be somewhere in the high sevens to 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 eights, um, because if it's a you know for me we we're talking about a lot about single family because I realize that's kind of your focus, but you know for my portfolio that's a you know, probably 20% of my overall loan portfolio. Most of my mm-hmm. portfolio is manufacturing companies and uh, professionals and commercial real estate, some other stuff that I'm dealing with. Um, but um, so it, it it's interesting in that we're, we have to price uh, to bake in our overhead too, but also remain profitable. So people think that, mm-hmm. you know, you know, like with a mortgage rate, it's typically you know, whatever the uh, five-year or 30-year treasury is plus 1% or something or 2%, something like that mm-hmm. is sort of the rule of thumb. Um, whereas we we have to price on our cost of money right now, which is high because of right. uh, the Fed fund rate. And what we yeah. have to pay people in their deposits right now in CDs and whatnot. Right. Interesting. Would it make any difference if someone came to you and said, I'm going to put a million dollars in deposits in your bank and you know, then you then you don't have to go out and borrow the money at all, or y- yeah. use other deposits, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, it's something we we evaluate as a bank when uh, we're looking at a deal, and and I think I said earlier we're we're not a transactional bank. Like we're not going to do mm-hmm. we're not going to come in and do one or two of these deals. It it needs to be a true relationship and like. Hey, we want not only do we want this rental property, we want your deposits. We want your, you know, the LLC or the company's deposits of this of this entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want your treasury relationship. We want potentially, you know, we own an insurance company, so we want, you know, potentially your insurance business. Um, and so it's a it's a relationship deal. And so yes, when we evaluate a credit, 
we say, okay, they've got a million dollars, as you mentioned in your example, that's the deposit base. Okay, well, that's great. So that, yes, that can help you tremendously when it comes to uh, perhaps getting a more of a, a, a beneficial rate than say, Joe coming in off the street mm -hmm. that has one, one or two rental properties that isn't going to move his deposit accounts to me, which I wouldn't do that deal anyway right now. But it, but historically, if you brought me a couple rentals and I'm going to get two loans for, you know, whatever X amount of dollars out of it, that's not really, you're going to get the, you know, the regular, regular Joe right. rate for, you know, right. but, um, but yeah, it's a relationship deal and we evaluate, you know, what our, what our income is to the bank with, treasury and you know deposits and things like that that it all goes into the calculation for sure mm -hmm. looking for long-term long-term mm -hmm. relationships um other than interest rates that you know is of course a trendy topic right now that everyone's talking about what other trends are you currently observing in the commercial lending sector um you know maybe if any more, what's that if any well, I mean, there's the there's the office sector that 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 everyone's very fearful of right now, and and has some vacancies. Uh, that we're not in a ton of office, but you're seeing even here locally. I mean, you're seeing some office get converted to uh, you know residential mm -hmm. um, because they just can't fill. And then we're also seeing office shifting from these sort of older downtown buildings to the newer stuff that you know, and they're willing to pay these premiums for these newer buildings, and so these older buildings are slowly going to either become vacant, uh, which some of them are, and or they're going to have to go in um, on the few that I know of downtown that they're going in and renovating some of these older buildings to try and entice people to stay. Um, mm -hmm. But um, th so the trend from that perspective, we're seeing that uh, for sure. We're also seeing sort of there was this influx of out-of-state investment money um that i'm sure you've seen too i know I've, we've talked about this a couple of times mm -hmm. um, there's this trend of out-of-state money that in my mind sort of overpaid for a lot of stuff in town and now that these rates are resetting you know they're like well crap i you know to me it's shocking that they didn't stress test these things at a higher rate level you know when they looked at the evaluated the credit you know and now we're you know we're hearing you know there's a couple that i've that have crossed my desk uh, over the last couple of weeks and you're like mm -hmm. they're, they're either gonna have to go have a capital call with their investors and pay that note down to a more reasonable level where that it actually works and, and when i say works it's like a break even mm -hmm. uh, or you're gonna have to take a loss and go sell that thing and get out and move on mm -hmm. because they can't ride it out they i mean at, at the at the current debt levels it just doesn't work so yeah. i'm seeing that a little bit uh recently and We've certainly passed on a couple of them because of that, but um, so it's interesting in that at, at some of these rates, as you alluded to, it, things just don't work. Um, mm -hmm. So I think yeah, and in, in many cases, you know, we I'm talking to a lot of investors who say, "Hey, I'm sitting on a pile of cash and I want to go buy a house, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house in you know wherever, and it, even if it brings in." you know, $1,800 a month and your cash on cash is five to 6%, right? I mean, say five and a half, why would you risk your money to buy an investment property at $250,000 when you could put in a 10 month CD and right. make the same amount with zero risk? And in the instances that they go out and they finance it and they put 25% down or 30% down or 50% down, you know, cash on cash is 4%, they find themselves in situations of negative, um, negative uh, leverage debt, where their cost yeah. of capital is higher than their rate of return, which uh, I wouldn't recommend to any investor, because it seems like you would be eroding your own wealth and the power of your money. Yeah, no, I, I that's exactly right. I've got a couple of my sort of larger single family clients that you know, they they purchase some stuff with cash, and they're just kind of waiting. And uh, if if and when rates drop, which they will, uh, you know, they'll they'll maybe leverage at that point. But they they have that's the thing is going back to my comment about the ideal client and who I'm looking for is someone with that ability to go in mm -hmm. and 
uh, pay cash for something. And, and then, you know, it not, I realize not everybody has that ability, but then they've got the ability to wait it out and then they can go back in and leverage later to re, you know, reimburse themselves for the, the funds that they use to buy that property. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's a wild, it, it's a wild time. Yeah. And don't, and to those investors who buy those and, you know, if they find those very opportunistic um, deals, right, maybe it's a dilapidated house that needs a ton of work and they're buying it for, you know, very little money compared to what other assets in the area are transacting at, right? Don't forget to force value and appreciation into your property through, um, you know, rehab and do it nicely. And, you know, if you can tear it to the studs and make sure that you're doing everything, HVAC, flooring, uh, plumbing, electrical, and the whole shebang so that you don't have to touch it and have any CapEx on it for eight to 10 years. Right. Yeah. And then in that in that time, that market cycle, you'll probably get to pull that money out and come to Jared and refinance your property and he'll be taking on um, single family homes again. Uh, right. And yeah, that may that would work a lot better. So, yeah. Um, talking about, you know, a little bit about like the future, what do you see as the future of commercial uh, banking and how do you think it will evolve if you had a crystal ball? you know, in the next decade, what in your mind is going to happen to the world of commercial lending? Uh, I, from a micro perspective, meaning Oklahoma and Tulsa, I see there's going to be, uh, my guess is there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the way of uh, banks. Uh, and there's going to be, you know, I was looking at the call report, which is the year end financials for the, for all the banks in Oklahoma yesterday. And a lot of banks are struggling with deposits and maintaining deposits, and they're full. So a loan to deposit ratio, which is what a mm -hmm. lot of banks look at in the way of, you know, how much powder do we have to go lend out? A lot of them are 100% and over 100%. And, mm -hmm. you know, Bank First sits at about 70%. So we've got a lot of, we've got the benefit of, um, you know, powder to go out and, you know, loan in the market. And I think what's going to happen is it's going to force some of these smaller banks to one, either having to slow down, um, which they already have, to uh, or go find a you know get new capital or or go buy deposits, which they they've had to do, and then three or or go you know sell the sell the bank, and mm -hmm. um, so I think the future for Tulsa at least might be a little shrinkage in the way of um, of, of amount of banks uh, uh, and some some, some con you know consolidation. I think from a macro perspective. Across the country, uh, I think there's been this sort of massive push for like technology and uh, and AI and sort of going away from the traditional brick and mortar banks, which I think is interesting. Um, but I I'm, I'm not ready to go full that direction yet. I think, like I said about Bank First, we kind of dip our toe in the water, and we've you know we've tested in a couple markets this sort of. I don't know if you've been to some of these other banks in town that. They no longer have sort of a uh, a teller front facing teller teller. It's more of like an ATM machine that you has a screen mm -hmm. on it, and you're dealing. With not. So it's that's sort of the the future, I think, and and I like that idea in the way of these sort of automated, truly automated teller machines that are people in call centers that are transacting, but they don't have to be a real person in a in a brick and mortar bank, mm -hmm. um, which I think for for safety reasons and uh, you know maybe more efficiency and cost savings at some mm -hmm. point, uh, I think it's a great idea. And I think that's something that I'd like to see us move towards at some point. It doesn't take away the human element, but uh, it sort of creates this, you know, we we monitor how many people come into our banks every day and how many are in, come into our branches. And that, you know, I don't know the last time you walked into a bank, but- It's been a while. Right, so the, the foot traffic, uh, walking into a bank is depleted, and so the need for sort of a new branch is is very minimal at this point for us. And so that's what I see is that going to happen in the future too? Is sort of this shift to sort of a a uh, a hybrid of human, but still a, a machine mm -hmm. uh, advancement. That's interesting. A lot of people are scared of that because of the. Um loss of you know employment opportunities and jobs but i think what they're not really recognizing is that 
human resources are probably the most important aspect of any business. And you're still going to need those human resources to implement these solutions and make them viable. Um, so, right. yeah, I, I, mean, I we, agree with we, that. We, we certainly, I mean, the front facing people, yes, the tellers, you might, you might shrink there slightly, but you still have backroom operational people. We have to, you know, we have oversight, we have uh, compliance. I mean, we've added to those teams probably at a higher rate than the teller, um, the teller level, just because that transaction level at the teller level is down. But, you know, you have to make sure that you're, um, you know, you're monitoring things and there's compliance and there's, you know, we have loan review teams, we have audit, all that, that um, ton of back office people. Yeah. I just, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, I had dinner with um, Bray Riley the other day and uh, he he's a compliance officer at another uh, right. local large bank. And, you know, he, he was telling me about his job and how much, uh, how much it takes to, you know, learn everything and, you know, research and have the ability to find the answers. So yeah. um, that is interesting. Um, I guess, you know, we talked really briefly earlier about misconceptions in commercial lending. Um, you know, how if you, sh if you shorten the amortization, you know, the misconception is that your interest rates is, you know, going to be a little bit more favorable, but that's not necessarily true in the commercial lending space, more so on the Fannie Freddie type of conventional products. Um, what other misconceptions uh, are common in the commercial lending space? Um, not to, not to take away from the mortgage, the consumer mortgage lender, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a, there's a thought that sort of we're similar in our, uh, our day to day as a, as a consumer mortgage, mortgage lender, which I look at them, you know, and may some, and I bank a few of them. So I think they may not like this comment, but I think some of them, they're more of a transactional, like they're doing deals, they're moving to the next person, they're moving to the next person. And they're, they're just trying to find the next deal. Mm -hmm. Whereas me, as I've said multiple times, like I'm looking for a relationship, a banking relationship, long-term relationship, grow with, and um, I'm not looking for a transactional relationship. And I, I, the misconception is that, hey, what's your rate? What's, you know, people that'll call mm -hmm. that don't really know me or don't know you know, much about the commercial side is they're like, all they care about is the rate. All they care about is their fees and that's it. Well, they're not really looking at the picture of, you know, uh, how do we grow together? How do we prosper? How do we uh, make my, meaning the, meaning the borrower's life better in the way of efficiencies that I can create with our banking products and services. So I think the misconception is that just, I'm just another, uh, you know, guy that's going to just provide you a rate and term whereas you know if you're calling me to shop rates i'm probably again not the guy that you want to mm -hmm. call for that i i'm i want to have a conversation about what's your vision and what you know uh where do you want to take this thing versus how do i get the cheapest rate and you know while that mm -hmm. stuff is important and i and i understand that i'm more i'm looking more for uh an overall relationship yeah so um, looking for the people, you're, you're in the business of uh, helping other people build and grow and scale their businesses uh, as a long-term going concern uh, and something that will, you know, have a positive impact on the community is right. what I'm taking from this. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So last question here, I guess, um, you know, it, talking maybe a little bit about the community, what is your approach to building and maintaining you know, those strong client relationships in the banking sector. I know you touched a little bit about, um, you know, talking to your clients, walking them through your visions. I'm, have you had any opportunities to uh, connect some of your clients to each other and, you know, help them scale the business in a way that's uh, a little bit more creative, unique, and um, yes. talk us uh, through that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the best things about, ha about having a sort of a diverse loan portfolio is that I've got clients in all different sectors and all different uh, uh, industries. And I've got, you know, plumbing clients, or I have an attorney client, I have a roofing contractor, I have a school, I have, you know, uh, retail strips, I have, you know, apartments and um manufacturing companies, wholesale supply, like it's all across the board. And so, yes, when I, 
you know, when I have a situation where someone needs a particular, let's call it a, a you know, a, a plumbing operation, I'm first to say, hey, you know, Joe Plumbing Company uh, is a client of mine, and they don't they don't mind me saying that because they want the business to be referred to them. And mm-hmm. so I say, you know, I, I'm happy to get you in touch with the owner. People love that, and um, you know, so it's I, I create sort of opportunities for my clients too. Um, in addition to, you know, hoping that I can help them directly, you know, sort of prosper as well. But um, how I maintain the the relationships is partially that, but also, um, as I touched on earlier, it's like, I, I will, I will never get outworked in the way of uh, how I take care of my clients. I, I've never lost it. I've never lost a client over um, lack of response or, or anything like that. Um, in fact, very rarely do when I lose one, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's more of, um, why, again, I chose this place, uh, to work for is it, it has such a great product that I can offer to my clients, uh, and not just the loan product, but, you know, the whole slew of bank products that I can offer. And then I can walk down the hall and talk to our trust operation, or I can walk, you know, over here and talk to our treasury group. Um, our chief credit officers in our building, even though we're headquartered out of Oklahoma City. So I can have these conversations at a $12 billion bank that a lot of other banks of our size, you're having to call somebody in Wichita, for instance, or wherever, and you're having to um, go through a bunch of layers to just have a conversation where at the meantime, you're going to lose the deal because you've taken too long Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so the speed and just ability of this operation has been so helpful for me in maintaining those relationships. Yeah. Love it. Because uh, I mean, you guys operate, um, you know, uh, more like a community bank, I guess, than anything. And so um, that allows you to be quick and agile and responsive. Right. Um, Jared, thank you so much for joining us today talking about, um, you know, your role as Senior Vice President of Commercial Lending at Bank First. Uh, how do people get in touch with you if they are, you know, looking for loan products and they are looking for a long-term relationship with a commercial lender at a reputable, as you said, twelve billion dollar bank? That's impressive. Yeah. Um, well, best is email uh, to start, and then we can, uh, you know, we've got, I, you know, we have a team here that um, we we have fourteen lenders in our office. Um, we, we work as a team. No one is competing against each other, which is also unique from a banking perspective. Uh, so we, you know, if a particular lender has a, an industry or, or niche that they're uh, really solid and comfortable with, a lot of times we'll, if that's an opportunity for them, we'll kick that opportunity to them. Or um, uh, So I'll, I'll start by my email, which is jared, J-A-R-E-D dot goldfarb, G-O-L-D-F-A-R-B at bank, B-A-N-C, first, F-I-R-S-T, dot B-A-N-K. I know it's a little long, but- Awesome. Uh, we'll put it in the comments so that yeah, people great. can uh, reach out to you. Um, and, you know, as uh, we are in the world of property management and love being connected to people, um, we'd love to get connected with your plumber. Yeah, so- oh, absolutely. And I, I, I didn't touch on this, but I- I know everybody in my world is appreciative of the, of the property manager. You keep a lot of this stuff in line. And um, when we see a property manager as involved, especially key renter, we, we are more likely to look at something like that uh, because of the, of the nature of your business and how you all operate. So uh, I think it's a, while it's, it, it is a very important part of it for sure, because it's a lot to manage. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you again. Thank you again, Jared, for yeah. uh, joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Same Day Podcast. Tune in to a new show each week and be sure to subscribe to get future episodes. 